sewer man is here. Thank goodness. How do you do, Mr. Sewer Man? But why do you have your boots in your hand instead of on your feet? Etiquette, Countess, etiquette. How very American. I'm told Americans nowadays apologize for their gloves if they happen to take one's hands. As if the skin of a human were nicer to touch than the skin of a sheep. Particularly if they have sweaty hands. <coughs> oh, my feet never sweat, Countess. How very nice. But please don't stand on ceremony here. Put your boots on. Thanks very much. You must have a very poor opinion of the upper world from what you see of it. The way people throw their filth into your territory is absolutely scandalous. I burn all my refuse, and I scatter the ashes. All I ever throw in the drain is flowers. Did you happen to see a lily float by this morning? Mine. But perhaps you didn't notice. Oh, we notice a lot more down there than you might think, Countess. You'd be surprised the things we notice. There's lots of things come along that were obviously intended for us. Little gifts, you might call them. Sometimes a brand new shaving brush. Sometimes the brothers Karamazov. Thanks for the little <laughs> countess. A very sweet thought. Tomorrow you shall have this iris, but now let's come to the point. I have two questions to ask you. Yes, countess? First, and this has nothing to do with our problem, it's just something that has been troubling me. Tell me, is it true that the sewer men of Paris have a king? Oh, now, countess, that's one of those fairy tales out of the Sunday supplements. It seems those writers can't keep their mind off the sewers. It fascinates them. They keep thinking of us moving around in our underground canals like gondolers in Venice, and it sends them into a fever of romance, the things they say about us. They say we have a whole race of girls down there who never sees the light of day. It's completely fantastic. The girls naturally come out every Christmas and Easter. <laughs> and orgies by torchlight with gondolas and guitars, with troops of rats that dance as they follow the piper. What nonsense. The rats are not allowed to dance. No, no, no. Of course we have no king. Down in the sewer, you'll find nothing but good Republicans. And no queen? We may run a beauty contest once in a while, or crown a mermaid queen of May, but no queen what you'd call a queen. And as for these swimming races you hear so much about, possibly once in a while, in the summer, in the dog days. I believe you, I believe you. Now tell me, do you remember the night I found you here, in this cellar, looking very pale and strange? You were half dead, as a matter of fact. And I gave you some brandy. Yes, Countess. That night, you promised me that if ever I should need it, you would tell me the secret of this room. The secret of the moving stone? I need it now. Only the king of the sewer men knows this secret. <laughs> I'm sure of it. I know most secrets, of course. In fact, I have three magic words that will open any door that words can open. I've tried them all, in various tones of voice. They don't seem to work. And this is a matter of life and death. Look, Countess. Good heavens, where do those stairs lead? Nowhere. They must go somewhere. They just go down. Let's go and see. No, Countess, never again. That time you found me, I had a pretty close shave. I kept going down and around, and down and around for an hour, a year. I don't know, there's no end to it, Countess. Once you start, you can't stop. Your head begins to turn, and you're lost. No. Once you go down, there's no coming up. You came up. I, I'm a special case. Besides, I had my tools, my ropes, and I stopped in time. You could have screamed, shouted. Could fire off a cannon. Who could have built a thing like this? Paris is old, you know. Paris is very old. You don't suppose by any chance there's oil down there? There's only death down there. Should have preferred a little oil as well. <laughs> or a vein of gold, or emeralds. You're quite sure there's nothing. Not even rats. How does one open it? Simple. To open <coughs> and to close. <coughs> now there's two of us in the world knows it. I won't remember long. Is it all right if I repeat my magic words while I do it? It's bound to help. And about that steam laundry that's supposed to be running in my sewer day and night, I can assure you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sewer Man. What nonsense. They never work nice. <laughs> Madame Constance and Mademoiselle Gabrielle are here. <laughs> Aurelia. Don't tell us they've found your feather boa. 
You don't mean Adolf Bertel has proposed at last. I knew he would. How are you, Constance? How are you, Gabrielle? You needn't shout today, my dear. Today is Wednesday. Wednesdays I hear perfectly. It's Thursday. Oh dear. Well, never mind. I'll make an exception just this once. <laughs> Come along, Dickie darling. Come along. And stop barking. What a racket you're making. We've come to see the longest boa and the handsomest man in Paris. You really must come along. Constance, it's not a question of my bow today, nor of poor Adam. Today, it's a question of the future of the human race. You think it has a future? Please don't make silly jokes. Hmm. Sit down and listen to me. Today, we must make a decision which may alter the fate of the world. Couldn't we do it tomorrow? I want to wash my slippers. Now, Dickie, we haven't a moment to waste. Where's Josephine? We'd best have our tea, but the moment that Josephine comes... Oh, yes. Josephine is sitting on her bench outside the palace waiting for President Wilson to come out. She says she's sorry, but she positively must see him today. Dickie! What a pity. I wish you were here to help us. She is a first-class brain. Uh -huh. oh, go ahead, dear. We're listening. What is it, Dickie, darling? You'd like to sit in Aunt Aurelia's lap? All right. Go along. Jump, Constance. We love you, as you know. And we love Dickie, but this is a serious matter. So let's stop being childish just this once. What exactly does that mean, if you please? It means Dickie. You know we love him and fuss over him just as if he were still alive. He's a sacred memory, and we wouldn't hurt his feelings for the world. But please don't plump him in my lap when I'm settling the future of mankind. His basket is in the corner. He knows where it is, and he can just go and sit in it. So you're against Dicky too? You too, Constance? I'm not in the least against Dicky. I adore Dicky. But you know as well as I that he's only a convention with us. It's a beautiful convention, but it doesn't have to bark all the time. <laughs> Besides, it's you that spoils him. That time you went to visit your niece and left him with me, we got along marvelously together. He didn't bark, he didn't tear things, he didn't even eat. But when you're with him, one can pay attention to nothing else. Now, I'm not going to take him in my lap at a solemn moment like this. Not for anything in the world, and that's that. Oh, Constance, dear, I don't mind taking him in my lap. He loves to sit in my lap. Don't you, darling? Kindly stop putting on angelic airs, Gabrielle. I know you very well, and you're much too sweet to be sincere. Well, I love animals. There are plenty of times when I pretend Dickie is here, when really I've left him at home, and you pet him just the same. You should never pet animals when they're not here. It's a form of hypocrisy. Oh, Constance. <laughs> Gabrielle has as much right as you. Gabrielle has no right to do what she does. Do you know what she does? She invites people to tea with us. People whom we know nothing about. People who only exist in her imagination. Well, I don't invite them at all. You know, they come by themselves. What can I do? Well, you might introduce us. If you think they're only imaginary, there's no point in your meeting them, is there? Well, of course they're imaginary. But who likes to have imaginary people staring at one? <laughs> Especially when they're strangers. Oh, but they're really very nice. Just tell me one thing, Gabrielle. Are they here now? Am I to be allowed to speak, or is this going to be the same as the argument about inoculating Josephine's cat when we didn't get to the subject at all? Never, never, never would I ever give my consent to that. Oh, Dickie, darling! Oh, Dickie! I would never do a thing to you like that. Good oh, heavens. Oh, sweet Dickie! Now we have her in tears. What an impossible creature. With the fate of humanity hanging in the balance. All right, all right. Stop crying. I'll take him in my lap. Come, Dickie. No. He doesn't want to go anymore. How can you be so cruel? Don't you suppose I know about Dickie? Don't you suppose I'd rather have him here and woolly and alive and frisking around the way he used to? You have your Adolf, and Gabrielle has her birds, but all I have is Dickie. Do you think I'd be so silly about him if it weren't that only by pretending he's here all the time, sometimes I get him to come, really? No, next time I won't bring him. Now, let's not get ourselves all worked up over nothing. Irma! Come, Dickie. Irma's going to take you for a nice walk. Uh, no, no, he, he doesn't want to go anymore. 
Besides, I didn't bring him today, so there. Very well, then. Irma, make sure the door is locked. Yes. Locked? Why locked? Who's coming? If you let me get a word in, you know by now. A terrible thing has happened. Oh. This morning, this very morning, exactly at noon. Oh, how exciting. Be quiet. This morning, exactly at noon, thanks to a young man who drowned himself in the Seine. Oh, yes, why well, think of it? Do you know a mazurka called the Belle Polonaise? Why, yes, Aurelia. Could you sing it now, this very minute? Yes. All of it? Yes, Aurelia. But who's interrupting now, Aurelia? You're right. Well, this morning, exactly at noon, I discovered a horrible plot. There is a group of men who intend to tear down the entire city. Is that all? <laughs> but I don't understand. Why should men want to tear down the city? When it was they themselves who put it up. You are so innocent, my poor Gabrielle. What? There are people who want to destroy everything. They have the fever of destruction. Even when they pretend to be building, it is only in order to destroy. When they put up a new building, they quietly knock down two old ones. They build cities so that they can destroy the countryside. They destroy space with telephones and time with airplanes. Humanity is now dedicated to the sole task of universal destruction. I'm speaking, of course, primarily of the male sex. <gasps> oh, dear. Aurelia! You must not talk sex in front of Gabrielle. There are two sexes. <gasps> yes, but Gabrielle is a virgin, Aurelia. She can't be as innocent as all that. She keeps canaries. Oh, I think you're being very cruel about men. Men are big and beautiful and loyal as dogs. Well, I prefer not to marry, it's true. But I have lots of friends that have been able to observe them closely. They give excellent reports. <laughs> you are still living in a dream. But one day you will wake up, as I have, and then you will see what is really happening in the world. The time has turned, my dear. Men are changing back into beasts. They know it. They no longer try to hide it. Just look at them, snuffling their soup like pigs, tearing their meat like tigers, crunching their lettuce like crocodiles. A man doesn't take your hand nowadays. He gives you his paw. Would it harm you so much if they turn into animals? Personally, I think it's a good idea. Oh, I'd love to see them like that. They would be sweet. It might be the salvation of the human race. You'd make a fine rabbit, wouldn't you? I? Naturally. You don't think it's only the men who are changing. You change along with them. Husbands and wives together. We're all one race, you know. You think so? And why would my poor husband have to be a rabbit if he were alive? Remember his front teeth? The way he nibbled his celery? I'm happy to say I remember absolutely nothing about him. All I remember on that subject is the time Father Le Cordier tried to kiss me in the park. Yes, yes, of course. And what exactly does that mean? Yes, yes, of course. Constance, look us in the eye and tell us truthfully, just this once. Did that really happen, or did you read about it in a book? No, I'm being insulted. We promise you faithfully we'll believe it all over again afterwards, won't we, Gabrielle? But tell us the truth this once. How dare you question my memories? Suppose I said your pearls were false. They were. I'm not asking what they were. I'm asking what they are. Are they false or are they real? Everyone knows that little by little, as one wears pearls, they become real. And isn't it exactly the same way with memories? Now do not let us waste time. I must go on. I think Gabrielle is perfectly right about men. There are still plenty who haven't changed a bit. There's an old senator who bows to Gabrielle every day when he passes her in front of the palace. And he takes his hat off every time. That's perfectly true, you know. But he's always pushing an empty baby carriage. And he always bows every time. Don't be taken in, Gabrielle. It's all make-believe. I warn you, don't let this senator with the empty baby carriage pull the wool over your eyes. He's really the soul of courtesy. He seems quite correct. Those are the worst, Gabrielle. Beware. Men have lost all sense of decency. They are all equally disgusting. Just look at them, sitting at their tables in the evening at their cafe, 
working away together in unison with their toothpicks, hour after hour, digging up roast beef, veal, onion. They don't harm anyone that way. Then why do you barricade your door and make your friends meow before you let them up? <laughs> Incidentally, Gabrielle and I must make an interesting sight, yowling together on your doorstep like a couple of tomcats. <laughs> There's no need at all for you to yowl together. One would be quite enough. Besides, you know why I must do it. It's because there are murderers. Well, I don't quite see what prevents murderers from meowing like everybody else. But why are there murderers? Why? Because there are thieves. And why are there thieves? Why is there almost nothing but thieves? Because they worship money. Because money is king. Now we've come to it. Because we live in the reign of the golden cap. Did you realize that, Gabrielle? Men now publicly worship the golden calf. How awful! Have the authorities been notified about this? The authorities do it themselves, Gabrielle. Oh, but has anyone told the bishop? Nowadays, only money talks to the bishop. And so you see why I asked you to come here today. The world has gone out of its mind. Unless we do something, humanity is doomed. And Constance, have you any suggestions? I know what I always do in a case like this. You write to the Prime Minister. He always does what I tell him. Does he ever answer your letters? He knows I prefer him not to. It might excite gossip. And what do you suggest, Gabrielle? Now how can she tell you until she's consulted her voices? I could go home right now and consult them. We'll meet after dinner. There's no time for that. Besides, your voices are not real voices. How dare you say a thing like that? Where do they come from? Still from your sewing machine? Not at all. They've passed into my hot water bottle, actually. And it's much nicer that way. They don't chatter. They gurgle. But they haven't been a bit nice to me lately. Last night, they kept telling me to let out my canaries. Let them out. Let them out. Let them out. Did you? Well, I opened the cage, but they wouldn't go. I don't call that voices. Objects talk. Everybody knows that. It's the principle of the phonograph. But to ask a hot water bottle for advice is silly. What does a hot water bottle know? All we have to consult here is our own judgment. Very well, then. Tell us what you've decided. Since you're asking our opinion, doubtless you've already made up your mind. Yes. I've thought it all through. All I really needed to discover was the source of the infection. Today I found it. Where? You'll see soon enough. I've baited a trap. In just a few minutes, the rats will be here. Rats, don't be alarmed. They're still in human form. Oh, heavens. What are you going to do with them? Now, that's just the question. Suppose I get them all here, in this room. Mm -hmm. Have I the right to exterminate them? To kill them? That's not a question for us. You'll have to consult Father Bridget. Yes. I have. Yes, one day in confession, I told him frankly, that I had a secret desire to destroy all wicked people. He said, by all means, my child, and when you're ready to go into action, I'll join you. That's just talk. You get him to put that into writing. What's your scheme? That's a secret. It won't be so easy to kill them, you know. Say you had a tank full of vitriol all ready for them. You could never just get them to walk into it. There is nothing so stubborn as a man when you want him to do something. Leave that to me. But if they're killed, they're bound to be missed. And then we'll be fined. They fine you for every little thing these days. They won't be missed. Oh, I wish Josephine were here. Her sister's husband is a lawyer. She knows all about these things. Do you miss the cold when it's gone? Or the germs that caused it? When the world feels well again, it will stretch itself joyfully and it will smile. That's all. Just a moment. Gabrielle, are they here now? Yes or no? What's the matter with you now? I'm simply asking Gabrielle if her friends are in the room. I have a right to know. I'm not allowed to say. I know very well they are. I can tell. Oh, otherwise you wouldn't be making faces. May I ask what difference it makes to you if her friends are in the room? Just this. If they're here, I'm certainly not going to say another word. I'm not going to commit myself in a matter involving the death sentence in front of third parties, whether they exist or not. Well, that's not being very nice to my guests. Constance, you must be mad. 
Do you really think that just because we're alone, there's nobody with us? There are millions of beings out there. My house is full of guests always. They know that here, they have a place in the universe where they can come when they're lonely and be sure of a welcome. For my part, I'm delighted to have them. You know perfectly well, Aurelia. I know perfectly well that at this moment, the entire universe is listening to us and that every word we say echoes to the remotest star. To pretend otherwise is the sheerest hypocrisy. Then why must you insult me in front of everybody? I'm not mean, I'm shy. I feel timid about giving my opinion in front of such a crowd. Furthermore, if you think I'm so stupid and bad, why would you invite me here in the first place? Madame Josephine is here. Thank heaven. I'm saved. My dear friends, today, once again, I waited for President Wilson, but he didn't come out. You'll have to wait quite a while longer before he does. He's been dead since 1924. I have plenty of time. <laughs> we have a legal problem for you. Suppose you had all the world's criminals here in this room. And suppose you had a way of getting rid of them forever. Would you have the right to do it? Why not? Exactly my point. But Josephine, so many people. De minimis non curat lex. The more there are, the more legal it is. It's impersonal. It's even military. It's the cardinal principle of battle. You get all of your enemies together in one place and you kill them all at one time. Because if you had to hunt them down one by one in their houses and offices, you'd get tired and sooner or later you'd stop. Aurelia, I think that your idea is very practical. I can't believe we didn't think of it sooner. Well, if you think it's the right thing to do, then of course. Your criminals have had a fair trial, I suppose. Trial? Certainly. You can't kill anybody without a trial. No man shall be deprived of his life, liberty, and property without due process of law. They deprive us of ours. That's not the point. You're not accused of anything. Every accused, man, woman, or child, has the right to defend himself at the bar of justice. Before the deluge, you will recall, the Lord permitted Noah to speak in defense of his fellow mortals. He evidently stuttered. You know the result. On the other hand, Captain Dreyfus was not only innocent, he was defended by a marvelous orator. The result was precisely the same. So you see, in having a trial, you run no risk whatsoever. But if I give them the slightest cause for suspicion, I'll lose them. There's a simple procedure prescribed in such cases. You may summon the defendants by calling them three times, mentally, if you like. If they don't appear, the court may designate an attorney to represent them. This attorney will then argue their case to the court in absentia, and a judgment will be rendered in consummatio. But I don't know any attorneys, and we have only ten minutes. You must hurry, Josephine. In case of emergency, it is permissible for the court to order the first passerby to act as attorney for the defense. A defense is like a baptism, absolutely indispensable, but you don't have to know anything to do it. <laughs> Ask Irma to get you somebody. Anybody. The deaf mute? That's cutting it a bit fine. That might be questionable on appeal. Irma! What about the police sergeant? He won't do. He's under oath to the state. Who's up there, Irma? There's all our friends. There's the rag picker. Send down the rag picker. Do you think it's wise to have all those millionaires represented by a rag picker? Oh, it's a first-rate choice. Criminals are always represented by their opposites. Murderers by somebody who obviously wouldn't hurt a fly. Rapists by a member of the League for Decency. Experience shows it's the only way to get an acquittal. But we must not have an acquittal. That would mean the end of the world. Justice is justice, my dear. Greetings, Countess. Greetings, ladies. My most sincere compliments. Has Irma told you? She said something about a trial. You have been appointed attorney for the defense. Terribly flattered, I'm sure. You realize, don't you, how much depends on the outcome of this trial? Do you know the defendants well enough to undertake the case? I go through their garbage every day. I know them to the bottom of their souls. What do you find uh, there? Mostly flowers. It's true, you know. The rich are always surrounded by flowers. Oh, how beautiful. Are you trying to prejudice the court? Oh, no, Countess, no. We want a completely impartial defense. Of course, Countess, of course. Permit me to make a suggestion. Josephine, will you preside? Instead of speaking as attorney, suppose you let me speak directly as defendant. I can get into it more, it'll be more convincing that way. Excellent.
Excellent idea. Motion granted. We don't want you to be too convincing, remember? Impartial, Countess. Impartial. Well, have you prepared your case? How rich am I? Millions. Billions. How did I acquire them? Theft, murder, embezzlement? Most likely. Do I have a wife? A mistress? Everything. All right, I'm ready. Will you have some tea? Ooh, is it good? Very good. The Russians drink nothing but tea. All right, tea then. Come in, come in, all of you. Take places. This trial is public. Aurelia, your bell if you please. But what if I need to ring for Irma? Irma will sit right here next to me. If you need her, she can ring for herself. Conduct the accused to the bar. This court is now in session. Counsel for the defense, you may take the oath. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Nonsense. You're not a witness, you're an attorney. It's your duty to lie, conceal, and distort everything, and to slander everybody. All right, I swear to lie, conceal, and to distort everything, and to slander everybody. <laughs> Quiet! Begin. May it please the honorable, elegant, and august court. Flattery will get you nowhere. That will do. The defense has been heard. Cross-examination. Mr. President. Madam. Do you know what you are being charged with? I can for the life imagine. My life is an open book. My ways are known to all. I am the pillar of the church and the sole support of the opera. My hands are spotless. What an atrocious lie. Just look at them. You don't have to insult the man. He's only lying to please you. Be quiet, Constance. You don't get the idea at all. You are charged with the crime of worshipping money. Me? Worshipping money? Well, do you plead guilty or not guilty? Which Wh is it? Why, Your Honor? <laughs> I... Yes or no? Yes or no? No! Heavens no! I don't worship money. Money adores me. It won't leave me alone. It's damned embarrassing, I can tell you. Kindly watch your language. Defendant, tell the court how you came by your money. Well... The first time money came to me, I was a mere child, a little golden-haired boy in the bosom of my dear family. It came to me suddenly, in the guise of a gold brick, which, in my innocence, I picked out of the garbage one day while playing. I was horrified, as you can imagine. I immediately tried to get rid of it by swapping it for a little run-down, one-track railroad, which, to my consternation, at once sold itself for a hundred times its value. In a desperate effort to get rid of my money, I began to buy things. I bought the Northern Refineries, the Galleries Lafayette, the Schneider Crusoe Munition Works. And now I'm stuck with them. It's a horrible fate, but I'm resigned to it. I don't ask for your sympathy. I don't ask for your pity. All I ask for is a little common human understanding. I object. This wretch is trying to play on the emotions of the court. The court has no emotions. Everyone knows that the poor have no one but themselves to blame for their poverty. It's only just they should suffer the consequences. But how is it the fault of the rich if they're rich? Dry your tears. You're deceiving nobody. If you are as ashamed of your money as you say, why is it you hold on to it with such a death grip? Me? You hold on to money? You wouldn't even give the poor deaf mute a sue. What slander! What injustice! What a thing to say in the presence of this honorable, elegant, and august court. I spend all my time trying to spend my money. If I have tan shoes, I buy black ones. If I have a bicycle, I buy a motor car. If I have a wife, I buy... Carter! I dispatch a plane to Java for a bouquet of flowers. I send a steamer to Egypt for a basket of figs. I send a special representative to New York to fetch me an ice cream cone. And if it's not exactly right, back it goes. But no matter what I do, I can't seem to get rid of my money. If I play a hundred to one shot, the horse comes in by twenty lengths. If I throw a diamond in the sand, it turns up in the trout they serve me for lunch. Ten diamonds, ten trout. Well, now do you suppose I can get rid of forty millions by giving a sou to a death mute? Is it even worth the effort? He's right. Ah. Finally. Someone who understands me. Somebody who is not only beautiful, but extraordinarily sensitive and intelligent. I object. Overruled. I should be delighted to send you some flowers, miss. Directly I'm acquitted. Which do you prefer? Roses. She'll have a bail every morning for the next five years. Money means nothing to me. And Amaryllis? I'll make a note of the name. The lady understands, ladies and gentlemen. The lady is no fool. She's been around and she knows what's what. If I gave the death mute a franc, 20 francs, 20 million francs, it still wouldn't make a dent in the 40 times a thousand million francs I'm afflicted with. Right, little lady? 
Right. Proceed. Like on the stock exchange. If you buy a stock, it sinks at once like a plummet. But if I buy a stock, it turns around and soars like an eagle. <laughs> if I buy it at 33... It goes, it goes up, up a thousand. It goes up 20,000. That's how I bought my 12 chateaux, my 20 villas, my 234 farms. It's how I endowed the opera and how I keep my 12 ballerinas. I hope every one of them deceives you every second of the day. How can they deceive me? Suppose they try to deceive me with the male chorus, the general director, the assistant electrician, or the English horn. I own them all, body and soul. It'd be like deceiving me with my big toe. Listen, Gabrielle. Listen to what? No. I am incapable of jealousy. I have all the women, or can have all of them, which is the same thing. I get the thin ones with caviar, the fat ones with pearls. So you think there are no women with morals? Ah. I mix morals with mink. Delicious combination. I drip pearls into protests. I adorn resistance with rubies. My touch is jeweled. My smile a motor car. What woman can withstand me? I lift my little finger and do they fall? Like leaves in autumn. Like tin cans from a second story window. That's going a little too far. You see where money leads. No. If you have no money, nobody likes you. Nobody trusts you. Nobody believes you. Because to have money is to be honest, virtuous, beautiful, and witty. And to be without it is to be ugly and boring and stupid and useless. One last question. Suppose you get this oil you're looking for. What do you propose to do with it? I propose to make war. I propose to conquer the world. You oppose the defense, such as it is. I demand a verdict of guilty. Guilty? I? I am never guilty. I order you to keep quiet. I am never quiet. Quiet in the name of the law. I am the law. When I speak, that is law. When I present my backside, it is etiquette to smile and to apply the lips respectfully. <laughs> no, it isn't etiquette. It is a cherished national privilege guaranteed by the Constitution. That's contempt of the court. This trial is over. And the verdict? Guilty! Guilty as charged. Then I have full authority to carry out the sentence. Yes! yes. I can do what I like with them. Yes. yes! I have the right to exterminate them. Yes! yes. Court adjourned! Congratulations, Brad Picker. Marvelous defense. Absolutely impartial. Had I known a little before, I could have prepared a speech. Like the time I used to sell the miracle spot remover. No need for that. You did very well. Extemporite. The likeness was striking in the style reminiscent of Clemenceau. I predict a brilliant future for you. Goodbye, Aurelia. I'll take our little Gabrielle home. I'm going to go on a walk along the river. Oh, there you are. Where have you been? And your ear all bloody. Have you been fighting again? Make sure she gets home all right, won't you? She loses everything on the way. In the queerest places. Her prayer book in the butcher shop. And her corset in church. <laughs> Permit me, madam. <clears throat> Countess. My mazurka, remember? Oh, yes. Constance, wait a moment. Begin. <clears throat> Do you hear, mademoiselle, those musicians of hell? Oh, why, of course. La Belle Polonaise. From Poland to France comes this marvelous dance. So gracious, audacious, will you afford it for a chance? I'm saved! Marvelous dance, so gracious, audacious, you fought in her chance.
afternoon nap. Suppose they come, Irma. I'll watch out for them. Thank you, Irma. I am tired. Did you ever see a trial in more happily in your life? Let's lie down a moment and close our eyes. Is it you, Adolphe Berteau? It's only Pierre. Don't lie to me, Adolphe Berteau. These are your hands. Say that it's you. Yes. It, it is I. Would it cost you so much to call me Aurelia? It is I, Aurelia. Why did you leave me, Adolphe Berteau? Was she so very lovely, this Georgette of yours? No. You are a thousand times lovelier. But she was clever. She was stupid. It was her soul then that drew you? When you looked into her eyes, you saw a vision of heaven, perhaps. I saw nothing. That's how it is with men. They love you because you are beautiful and clever and soulful. And at the first opportunity, they leave you for someone who is dull and plain and soulless. I know very well she wasn't rich. Because when I saw you that time at the grocer's, you snatched the only good melon from right under my nose. Your cuffs, my poor friend, were badly frayed. Yes, she was poor. Was poor? Is she dead then? If it's because she's dead that you've come back to me, then no, go away. I will not take their leavings from the dead. I refuse to inherit you. No, she's quite well. Your hands are still the same, Adelberto. Your touch is young and firm, because it's the only part of you that has stayed with me. The rest of you is pretty far gone, I'm afraid. You can see why you'd rather not come near me when my eyes are open. It's thoughtful of you. Yes, I have aged. Not I. I am young because I haven't had to live down my youth like you. I have it with me still as fresh and beautiful as ever. But when you walk now at the park at Columns with Georgette, I'm sure. There's no longer a park at Columns. I've never gone back to see. But I imagine if trees could move, they would have walked away in disgust the day you went there with Georgette. They did. Not many are left now. You take her also, I suppose, to hear Denise? Nobody hears Denise anymore. It was on the way home from Denise, Adelphe Berto, that I first took your arm. Because it was windy and it was late. I've never set foot on that street again. Oh, my darling, forgive me. No, I will never forgive you. It was very bad taste to take her to the very places where we've been together. All the same, I swear. Oh, really? Don't swear. I know what you did. You gave her the same flowers, bought her the same chocolates, but has she any left? No. I have all your flowers still. I have twelve chocolates. I will never forgive you as long as I live. I have always loved you, Aurelia. I shall always love you. Yes, I know. That much I've always known. And I knew that nothing could ever change it. Georgette is in his arms now, yes, but he loves me. Tonight he's taken Georgette to hear Denise, yes, but he loves me. I know it. You never loved her. Do you think I believe for a moment that absurd story about her running off with the osteopath? Of course not. Since you didn't love her, Obviously, she stayed with you. You'll never get rid of her, Adelberto, never. Because you don't love her. I need your pity, Aurelia. I need your love. Don't forget me. Farewell, Adelberto. Farewell. Let go my hand and give it to little Pierre. Pierre, it's you. Has he gone? Yes, Countess. I didn't hear him go. He knows how to make a quick exit, that one. 
Good heavens, wherever did you find it? In the wardrobe, Countess, when I took off the mirror. Was there a little child's sewing box with it? No, Countess. They're frightened now, those men. They're quietly putting back all the things they've stolen from me. The one thing I really miss is my little child's sewing box. I got it for Christmas when I was seven. They stole it the very next day. I cried my eyes out every time I thought of it, till I was eight. You're sure they haven't put it back? It's not there, Countess. Splendid. Then I'm under no obligation to be merciful. Put the bow around my neck, Pierre. I want them to see me wearing it. They'll think it's a real boa. They're here! You're right! It's a whole procession! The street's full of taxis and limousines. <coughs> I'll receive them. Don't worry. There's nothing to be frightened of. Don't forget, I'm supposed to be dead. I want to hear what they're thinking. Come, the President's here. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. President. You're expected, Mr. President. The Countess, she's very deaf. You'll have to shout. I had a premonition, madame, when I saw you this morning, that we should meet again. I want to thank you for your trust. You may place yourself in our hands with complete confidence. You'll have to speak up. The old coot can't hear you. Uh, we have a letter here in which... Is it true that you have found oil? Excellent. Sign here, please. What is it? I have it in my glasses. Your contract. Thank you. What is it actually? A waiver of rights. <laughs> All right. Thank you, madame, and congratulations. Now, if you'll show us to the well, this gift will be yours. What is it? Pure gold, 24 karat. For you, madame. Thank you. It's heavy. We're not really going to let her keep that, are we? We'll pick it up again on the way out. Uh, is this the way? Yes, wait right over there. Help us, the prospect is here too. The Countess, she's very dead. You'll have to shout. Oil! Where's the oil? Right over there. The press is here. The Countess is very dead. You'll have to shout. Madame, I am the press. You know my power. I set all standards and fix all values. Your entire future depends on me. The well is right over there. I don't need to see that. I can imagine it. But if you don't see it, how do you know it's there? If it's there, all's well and good. If it's not, it will be by the time I'm through. Wait right over there. You have freed us. Sadness flies on the wings of night. And out of the heart of darkness comes the light. Well, there we are. The world is saved. You see how simple it all is. Nothing is ever so wrong in this world that a sensible woman can't set it right in the course of an afternoon. Now on to more important things. It's 10 o'clock. My poor cats must be starved. What a bore for them if humanity had to be saved every day. They don't think much of it as it is.
for everything you do to keep theater a part of the school and to keep it alive here and everything you've done for us over the years. We're really honored that we've been able to work with you as a director and for everything you've given us and we're really going to miss it. So we wanted to say thank you. Thank you for the last four years, Jean. Yeah.